Well, there's your problem, boss, right there. Looks like that fan blade is missing, broke off right near the shank. These are hollow fan blades. When this blade failed, it looks like it took out this half of this blade. It looks like the engine casing is still intact. And here, when this blade failed, the angle of attack of that blade <clears throat> would have hit the Kevlar casing and kicked that blade out the front of the engine, slicing this engine inlet ring right here, causing the beginning of the rest of the cowling around the engine to fail. Once this blade sliced through this inlet ring, that knocked this ring off of the cowling. This ring, now the rest of the cowling no longer has anything structurally and aerodynamically to hold it together to prevent the slipstream of nearly 200 knots of wind from blowing the rest of the cowling apart in conjunction with the extreme vibration of this approximately 34 pound blade missing from shaking that cowling to pieces. Here we can see on a still frame, there's the missing blade right there in flight, and there's the missing half a blade right there. And there's the slice through the nose ring cowling. It's time for an update. It's Monday, February 22nd. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. As a result of this most recent fan blade failure, plus three prior incidents of Pratt & Whitney engine fan blade failures on the 4000 series engine, plus the Netherlands 747 Pratt & Whitney 4000 series engine, a slightly different series than, than on this Boeing 777, the Pratt & Whitney manufacturers are stepping up inspections on these fan blades and United has grounded its fleet of Boeing 777-200s that have the Pratt & Whitney engine on board. Economically, probably not a big deal right now as demand for flying is low and um, many fleets are phasing out some of their older 777s to begin with in order to save money. If you've been following this channel for the last couple of years, back in 2018, we learned a lot when the fan blade failure occurred on Southwest Airlines of Flight 1380 back in 2018. Now that was with a CFM engine, but nevertheless, the physics were the same. And what they learned, or what we all learned uh, during that incident was that when that fan blade failed, it f failed such that the angle of attack of these blades is such that when they hit the fan case they can skip out of the front of the engine and I believe that's what they're gonna find happened in this case slicing that nose ring cowling and beginning the sequence of events to blow that cowling apart what we also learned as the NTSB went through the process of learning about this themselves when these aircraft engines are certified they are certified to handle a fan blade out event. They are certified to handle a single fan blade failing and the engine containing that energy. When they run those tests, they're on a test stand. When they run those tests, they are without the cowling installed. When they run those certification tests, they are not, the cowling is not required to be able to remain on the engine, if you will. So when you do this in the real world at 200 or 250 knots, chances are the cowling is going to fly to pieces. And that's what's happened in several of these incidents up to now. In the case of the Southwest flight, I believe they determined that that was a contained engine failure, even though it resulted in the fatality of a passenger. That fatality was caused by a piece of the cowling flying back and popping out a window and fatally injuring a passenger. Now I want to go back and answer some questions from the first update I did on the United Airlines 
engine failure over Denver. First off, the first question, what about fuel dumping? That's kind of an older notion for older aircraft. The Boeing 777 can land at its maximum gross weight. It has a maximum landing weight of about 460,000 pounds, some almost 200,000 pounds below the, the max gross weight, but it can land above its maximum landing weight just fine. The only thing that means is that folks are going to have to do a overweight landing inspection on that aircraft and they'll be looking closely at the data to see how hard the aircraft touched down to determine the extent of that inspection. Before every takeoff on every flight, as I said before, these aircraft are designed, every takeoff on every flight, they are designed to handle a takeoff with a loss of an engine at the most critical point, that's V1 rotate, just as you break the ground, and this is what crews are trained for every nine months or 12 months in the simulator, they, we go through this exercise of losing an engine right at V1 on a heavyweight takeoff. <clears throat> and we, the crew and the airplanes are designed to climb out on the remaining one engine, fly around the pattern and land uneventfully. So prior to every takeoff, we get together as a crew and brief, what are we going to do in the event of an emergency? During that briefing, one of the pilots whips out a thing called a landing app, an app on your iPad to calculate your landing distance in the event of an emergency at your current weight to determine if or if not to dump fuel. The whole idea for dumping fuel is to make sure that you can get that aircraft landed and stopped safely in the amount of runway that you have available to return to. And if you look at the numbers for the Boeing 777 for a single engine landing, more on that in a minute, you'll find that you'll have plenty of room to get that aircraft stopped at your current takeoff weight Thus, you do not need to dump fuel. Besides, look at this situation that happened uh, the other day out of Denver. You don't want to, <laughs> you've already scattered cowling parts all over the children of uh, western Denver there. You don't want to add f fuel to the fire, so to speak, and, and dump fuel all over a residential area. Remember how much we learned when the Delta flight did do that out of Los Angeles, how, how much problems that caused them. Also, too, with a fire on the engine, the checklist says, do not dump fuel in the event of an engine fire. You don't want to light that barbecue. So there's no need to be dumping fuel or even worrying about dumping fuel in this case. You've already crunched the numbers. You've already briefed it as a crew that in the event of an engine failure, we will not be dumping fuel. So why did this particular engine appear to continue to burn after the engine was shut down and after the T-handle was pulled? When you run through the engine fire checklist, it has you shut the engine down and pull the fire handle and blow the bottle, blow the extinguisher. Each aircraft has two fire extinguishers on board the aircraft. Each engine, one engine, you can fire both of those bottles into one engine if the fire warning continues or if the fire continues. Now what investigators are going to need to find out on this, and this will be a very interesting case study, how well did the fire suppression system work with the cowling knocked off of the uh, engine in this case? Was the fire suppression system hampered by the loss of the cowling? Were you just creating a, a white fart in the wind without the cowling on the airplane when you blew the bottle, if the bottle uh, worked as advertised? Regardless, the fire that you're looking at is inside what's called the blocker veins. The little squares you see on the side of the airplane, that's part of the thrust reversing system on the Boeing 777. That fire appears to me to be just a bit of residual, either hydraulic fluid or residual oil, possibly an oil leak out of the engine from a, a bent shaft or something. It, it appears to me that the fuel shut off just fine for this engine, and what we're looking at is a little bit of residual fire and further damage from the engine. Which brings me to my second point, the second most asked question is, what w would have happened had this occurred halfway to Hawaii? Remember, every one of these flights is designed and engineered under ETOPS, extended twin engine operations. This allows uh, twin engine aircraft to operate up to three hours 
from a suitable alternate airport on two engines. <clears throat> Flying to Hawaii is one of those longest legs that you will have to operate under ETOPS conditions. You only have the two alternates, the West Coast, either San Francisco, Los Angeles, Vandenberg, or Hawaii. But the flight is designed and flight planned to fly that flight by losing the engine at the worst possible moment, which is the equal time point, not the equal distant point, but the equal time between two points, and continue that flight on one engine. When you lose one engine, and I've done this before, if you lose one engine out there over the ocean, <clears throat> you gotta descend down to the habitable altitude for that single engine operation. In other words, you cannot, you're typically cruising to Hawaii in about 35,000 feet, 38,000 feet, and when you lose that one engine, you're gonna have to lower, in the 777, you're gonna have to get down to uh, the lower 20,000 feet range. When you get down to that altitude, that remaining, one engine is going to be burning quite a bit more fuel at that one low altitude, at that lower altitude. So the whole fuel plan is designed for this. In fact, the fuel plan is also designed for another worst case scenario, which may require even more fuel, and that's if you had a rapid depressurization halfway between the two points, and you needed to go all the way down to 10,000 feet and continue the flight on two engines at 10,000 feet. So all of that is looked at, reviewed, and flight planned for. Now, the, looking at the condition of this engine begs the question of that fire. Is that, would that fire have gone out? Um, and also concerning to me is the amount of vibration that a windmilling engine produces with a 34 pound fan blade out of that engine. How long can that engine tolerate that? Now remember the engines on the Boeing 777 on any airliner are mounted such, they got a three point mounting system, such that those mounts are designed to shear or fail if one engine should fail so catastrophically or shake so bad, the engine mounts will fail before it's allowed to transfer that damage to the wing of the aircraft. Another thing to consider is, uh, that I've been thinking about a lot is during these ETOPS flights to maintain the FAA requirements you are supposed to continue to your destination on one engine at ETOPS speeds which means you are to descend to your habitable altitude and continue to your destination on one engine at your the same cruise speed that you were cruising at before the engine failed. In other words you're designed the flight plan is designed to descend, get to a habitable altitude, and go fast to your destination. You don't want to be hanging out over the water as long, very long on one engine. You want to minimize your exposure to that. Typically on a single engine failure, you will get a, a single engine speed that is considerably slower than your ETOP speed or your cruise speed before the engine failed. Now, with this windmilling and shaking around and about, I'm thinking, man, you might want to slow that airframe down and to try to minimize the shaking of that engine. Just something to think about. You have plenty of fuel and range to do that on these aircraft. Cameras on board the aircraft. I don't know if Boeing's uh, 200 series of 777s has the onboard camera, but I know the 300 series of aircraft does have an onboard camera. There are three cameras. They're primarily designed to look at the landing gear, so when you're taxiing around on the ground, you don't run, the thing is so huge, you don't run it off into the ditch. Now, in flight, you can turn that camera on and look at the rear of the engine, so you can get a, a good a look at the rear of the engine with these cameras, but that's all you can see is the very aft end of the engine because these cameras on the 300 are mounted right here on the horizontal tail looking this direction towards the main landing gear and in that view you can see the rear of the engine. There's one more camera mounted up here that allows you a view of the nose wheel. Question about use of the autopilot. Yeah, the autopilot is outstanding in the Boeing 777 and the Boeing 777 also has a feature built into the rudder where it will automatically trim the rudder for you in the event of an engine failure and will assist you and the autopilot with keeping the aircraft in a trimmed condition 
on one engine. It really makes the loss of an engine on the 777 very easy. Also on the Boeing 777 you have two auto throttle switches so you can switch off the auto throttle to the affected engine, leave on the auto throttle to the remaining good engine, and leave the autopilot coupled and fly the entire pattern on autopilot with one engine. Same thing with the ILS approach. As I briefed earlier, you want to get on that single engine ILS approach so that you have, you're locked into the glide path to maintain, to maximize your chances for a stabilized approach to landing, to minimize the chances of botching the approach and forcing yourself into a single engine go around. Though we practice that every time we go into the simulator, it's not something, it's something you'd rather just prevent uh, rather than having to <laughs> demonstrate your superior flying skills in the event of an actual emergency. And by flying a stabilized single engine ILS approach, that helps. And the other thing about a single engine approach, any single engine approach, is you're going to use a slightly lower flap setting. You won't lower all the flaps for a single engine approach just for that case in the event of a go around. You want to have enough energy in the aircraft on one engine to safely go around on that one engine should you need to. So you don't lower full flaps for a single engine approach and landing. That means your approach speed is going to be fairly high. Regarding the use of thrust reverser on the one remaining engine, yes, you can reverse on one engine. The pilot monitoring will remind you that you only have a reverse on the one good engine, but you can go ahead and use it. It does not give you a lot of adverse yaw, and it does not also add a whole lot of stopping capability to your, to your stop, but you can use reverse engine on one engine. And then finally to the ground evac. This is one that's of a constant debate. The, but the statistics show that more people are often injured in the event of a ground evacuation than, than need be. And if you can avoid doing a ground evacuation, you should avoid it. So by getting the aircraft stopped on the runway, you've got all the emergency crews right there. They're talking to you right away. They've got eyes and equipment on that remaining engine fire, and they can get that engine fire out very quickly. So you can avoid having to do a ground evacuation. And this is backs up to the part where I say, typically you want the, once the emergency gets underway, you want the roles to change in the cockpit such that the captain is the pilot monitoring and the first officer is the pilot flying. Besides, the first officer is probably better at landing anyways, but the first officer, all he has to do is concentrate on flying the aircraft and, and talking to ATC. Just one, two simple jobs. Meanwhile, the captain has the big picture of the whole emergency and begins this giant coordination effort of going through the checklists, making sure the correct checklists are done in the correct order, and by following those checklists, there will also be a series of coordinations you need to do with the flight attendants in back. And one of those very important coordinations is, how is this emergency going to end? And are we expecting a ground evacuation or not? So you want to prime the flight attendants for how you figure this landing is going to turn out. We're going to stop on the runway. We're going to have the emergency crews check in the aircraft. And I'm not anticipating a ground evac. And this will prevent the possibility of an uncommanded ground evacuation where a flight attendant maybe panics and orders up a ground evacuation when the captain, in fact, did not order it himself. So that's why the, the captain needs to become the pilot monitoring and coordinate this big exercise because a lot of things got to go right to make sure that nobody gets hurt. So that's the update for now. We'll have more information as we get more information on this. I got to go to work right now. I'm going to London. See you there.